Okay, hello. As you can see, I've switched back to uh, ManyCam because mm -hmm was so laggy last week, but I'm in touch with mm -hmm support. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, they, hopefully there's some way I can get that to work because I think it was better. But all right, for now I'm back to this. Um, which means actually I should test to make sure it's not as of now, it's not frozen. Um, <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, so I decided I am going to start this time by talking about names of substances a little bit that I didn't get to last week. It's so important. Um, hopefully I'll have time for that and the new material. Um, uh, next week is the last lecture on locks, so it's not going to go over from that into Barclay. So whatever I don't get to next week, I just won't get to. <laughs> um, okay, I have a peanut gallery going here. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so names of substances. Um, okay, so this is basically a subtopic of general names, right? Because what we're talking about here is general names of substances, not uh, proper names. Um, And uh, so these are to be compared to uh, modes, right? They're collections of simple ideas that we put together that are supposed to potentially um, agree with a lot of different things. Um, but of course, they're different from modes because we join to them this obscure idea, but apparently necessary idea of a certain subject in which the qualities that are the cause of those simple ideas uh, in here, that is a, a certain thing that has those powers. Right, so the idea of a substance is the idea of something that has a bunch of powers. Um, so, uh, right, so for example, the idea of gold is the idea of something that's yellow, malleable, heavy, etc. Those, the things in that list are all powers, either there's uh, secondary qualities, that is, powers to cause a certain, um, well, or they could be primary qualities, but in that list they're not. They're secondary qualities. Hmm. Yes. Well, anyway, <laughs> a list of secondary qualities like yellow, right, which is, the which is the power that it has to cause me to perceive the simple idea of yellow. Um, but also some of them are um, powers that it has with respect to other things, either active or passive, right? So like if solubility in aqua regia is one of the, one of the uh, elements of my idea of gold, that means it has the passive power to be dissolved upon uh, exposure to aqua regia, which is a combination of nitric and hydrochloric acid, I think. Um, or uh, like fusibility is the power it has to uh, turn into a liquid when exposed to, to fire or to extreme heat. Um, so gold is the thing that has all those qualities, the subject in which they inhere. Um, And um, so a, a general name of substances is supposed to be the name of a sort 
of subject which has certain powers. Now, um, why does that sort of subject have those powers? Um, so there's two ways of seeing that. So let's say, like, here's gold, which is the name of, um, certain things that all have these powers. And if you ask, why do they all have those powers? So one way of looking at the answer is, well, if you knew what these things actually were. Now, what does that mean? Of course, well, we know that they're, that they're a subject, that is, that they're substance. That's really, as Locke says, something we know not what. Right? Our general idea of substance is confused and relative. But, um, but there are substance with certain um, uh, real qualities. That is, with a certain real structure. And that is, as we know, since these substances are, are all corporeal substances, they're bodies, that is, that they have a certain uh, bulk, figure, figure, texture, and motion of parts. Those are the qualities that a body can really have. So, um, and if all of these bodies have the same powers with respect to us and with respect to other bodies, that must be presumably because there's something similar about the relation, the bulk, figure, texture, and motion of those small parts that makes them all do the same stuff, right? I mean, it's either that about them or we can't conceive what it would be about them because those are the only real qualities we can conceive of them having. So... Um, so that would be one way of answering why do all of these things have the qualities on our that's that you know go towards the the qualities that cause the simple ideas that go to make up our idea of gold. It's because of something about um, their microscopic structure regarded as bodies. Another way of answering the same question would be to say, why do all these things have those qualities? Well, like, how have we collected these things that the word gold applies to? Well, the word gold is the, is the sign of a certain complex idea. And we've collected all these things together because they conform to that complex idea. So, of course, they all have the qualities that cause the simple ideas that make up that complex idea. That's why they all have those qualities. By definition, so to speak. So those two ways of answering the question correspond to the distinction that Locke draws between the real essence of a certain sort or species of substance and the nominal essence. The real essence of gold is whatever structure all pieces of gold have in common of their small parts that makes them all do those same things. And it also makes them all do certain other things that aren't part of our complex idea, right? So, do, I mean, the complex idea that we associate with the word gold could be different, locked you know, discusses different possibilities, but suppose that the complex idea I associate with the word gold is 
yellow, heavy, fusible, and malleable. So, um, right, malleable, I guess, means it can be shaped with a hammer. Um, so, uh, um, that's my complex idea. But uh, I also find that everything that's gold is soluble in aqua regia. So that wasn't part of my complex idea, but that's something I've learned about those things. So that must also be to, due to that same texture of microscopic parts that is the real essence of gold. So the real essence of gold is whatever the, you know, the pieces of gold have in common that makes them have... Um, all the qualities I use to identify gold, and also whatever are the additional properties of gold. Whereas the nominal essence of gold, if we assume that the idea I associate with the word gold is yellow, heavy, fusible, and malleable, the nominal essence of gold is that idea, yellow, fusible, malleable, wait, what did I say? Yellow, heavy, fusible, and malleable, plus, of course, the conf confused idea of substance. So, um, and the basic idea of everything that Locke has to say about the names of substance, and therefore the relation, and the relationship between those two essences, is um, summarized uh, in Book 3, Chapter 3, Section 15, on page 374. Okay. Tis true, there is ordinarily supposed a real constitution of the sorts of things. And tis past doubt there must be some real constitution on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. So there is a real essence. Um... um you know, you might ask, couldn't it be some completely different arrangement of small parts that causes these qualities in each case? I think Locke's answer to that is that in some abstract sense, they must still all have something in common if they have the same effects. And compared to his discussion of the different kinds of watches, that they all have the same effect that makes the hands go around in a certain way. Inside, some of them are built with springs and some with hog bristles, and <laughs> whatever, in various ways. But there's still something in common to all those mechanisms, even though they don't look very similar, as you can tell from the fact that they do the same thing. So I think that's why he's saying it's past, it's past doubt. Of course, there is some real essence of gold. There's something about all those pieces of gold that makes them, and not anything else, have all those qualities. But he continues, but it being evident that things are ranked under names into sorts or species, only as they agree to certain abstract ideas to which we have annexed those names, the essence of each genus or sort comes to be nothing but that abstract idea which the general, or sortal, if I may have leave so to call it, blah, 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 sorry. Um, or sortal, name stands for. Right? So there is a real essence, but the real essence isn't how we actually divide things into sorts. We actually divide things into sorts using the nominal essence. Um, so, like, if it weren't for the nominal essence, there would be no such type of thing as gold. We've collected those things together because they agree with the nominal essence. 
so like how 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 can we be so sure that we sort things by the nominal essence and not by the real essence? Well, uh, Locke has a lot of arguments, but he says first of all, we don't know what the real essence is, and we never will know. So we can't be using it to sort things out. You know, I mean. You might think, and this might be right, that now we do know what the real essence of gold is. Ray, I mean, because we would no longer define gold as a substance, yellow, heavy, fusible, malleable, etc. We would define it as a chemical element of atomic number, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> I forget. But anyway, I mean, in other words, we would define it in terms of the properties of its very small parts or particles that cause it to have the qualities that it does. Um, so, uh, although those very small parts are not exactly bodies, um, given quantum mechanics, and so forth, you know, they don't have solidity, and etc. But in any case, um, uh, Locke says we never will know that, and it was pretty reasonable for him to say that, right? Like it was very difficult to learn about that stuff, and in Locke's time, they were very far from it. So he's saying, yeah, I mean, we never will know these very small particles that are way, way too small for us to see or detect in any way. So we, but as we certainly don't know now, so we're not using it to sort things as gold versus other things. Um, and number two, he says, even if we did know, um, and then there's two things. First of all, he says, even if we did know, we wouldn't understand the connection between that texture of small parts and the secondary qualities that we, uh, the, the ideas of secondary qualities that we perceive, right? So he says, we, we never, there's no conceivable connection between some texture, bulk, figure, motion, etc., of bodies and the perception of the idea that we call yellow. We understand how bodies can cause motion in other bodies, but how bodies can cause the mind to perceive this idea yellow, we don't know. God made that happen somehow, <laughs> but we don't understand it, and Locke seems to think that we couldn't possibly understand it. Whether we understand that now is a more difficult question. I mean, um, we understand... I think Locke just kind of neglects the fact that we might understand a lot in, of that process in terms of that whenever something looks yellow, the end result is always a certain thing that happens in my retina, and then from there back it's the same. So like if we understand why gold makes a certain thing happen in our, in our retina when light bounces off it and bounces into our eye, then we kind of understand why it makes us perceive the idea gold. But the truth is, if you ask, well, why does that thing happening to your retina, and then certain things happening with neurotransmitters and so on and so forth, make you perceive that idea we call yellow, uh, if that's a good question at all, we don't know the answer any more than Locke did. But, okay, so in any case, that's another reason he says we couldn't use them. We couldn't know the real essence of gold. It wouldn't help us to sort things into types. And furthermore, he says that supposing we knew all of that, we still wouldn't know where to... So these pieces of gold all have certain characteristics in common with each other. But Locke says presumably they have characteristics in common with other things too, and on the other hand they're different from each other. Again, maybe in some deep sense that's not true now when we describe it, like all electrons are the same and all like atomic nuclei of such and such a number are in some sense the same and 
they don't have anything in common with other things. I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's actually not exactly true. So like, here's one way you can see it's not true. There are different isotopes of gold. They all agree with each other in having the same atomic number, but they, their nucleus has a different weight. They have more neutrons or fewer neutrons. So, so to that, you can apply Locke's point, at least, where we say, okay, how do we know what max marks the boundary? What makes the real essence different enough that this counts as a new kind of thing? And Locke says, the real essence can't tell us that. Right? As far as the things themselves are concerned, they're similar to each other in some ways and different from each other in other ways. And they're similar to other things in some ways and different from other things in other ways. What makes them all count as one sort, different from everything else? The fact that we have assigned the word gold and attached to it an abstract idea of the nominal essence. That's what makes them all one sort. So the nominal essence, um, as he was saying in that passage I just read, the nominal essence really is the essence of the sort. It's the thing that makes the sort a sort. The real essence, we don't know, and even if we did know, it wouldn't uh, help us to define the boundaries of the sort. So, um, Therefore, uh, it's wrong to think of our general names of substances as naming a bunch of things that have the same real essence. I mean, again, it is past doubt that these things do have some common real essence. But that common real essence is unknown to us, and we can't make our word a sign of it. And also, again, even if it were known to us, um, we couldn't make our general word a, a sign of what's general about it without introducing our own idea. The thing itself won't tell us where to draw the line. So... Um, so therefore, the names of substances are abused when we take them to name real essences or to be signs of real essences. Um, so if we say something like, um, uh, could we discover that some kind of gold is actually blue? Um, we're misunderstanding the way we use the names of substances. Um, you know, it could be that something that has a similar arrangement, bulk figure detection of microscopic parts to the things we call gold is actually blue. But that thing is not gold because it doesn't conform to our... Um, complex idea that we have made the name gold a sign of. So we start thinking that way, we are um, misunderstanding the way we use our words. And example, when we start saying to ourselves something like, um, um, I wonder if uh, human beings with a certain type of uh, disability or apparent human beings with a certain type of disability, are they really human beings or not? We start wondering that, 
right? Like idiots or whatever. Um, we're misunderstanding the situation. We have to decide what things to put into our idea of human being. So we could put just a certain shape, which Locke says is what we usually do, or we could add rationality to the idea. So uh, to, uh, to, for the first nominal essence, where it's just a certain shape, basically, and you know some other things like motion and nutrition or whatever, um, um, the answer is, well, uh, those idiots have the same shape and they move and they have nutrition and whatever, therefore they are human beings. And with the second nominal essence, uh, where we included rationality, if they've never shown any sign of rationality, then according to that nominal essence, they're not human beings. And uh, um, we're confusing ourselves about what the nature of that question is. Now, I mean, Locke thinks there is something to worry about in that location, and he talks about it in book four. But if we think that what, what we're worrying about is whether the real essence of human beings is found in them or not, we misunderstand the situation. It's up to us to decide what the essence is. It also means we're responsible for our decision, what the essence is. That has certain consequences. Um, you know, and actually here's an example of this, and this example that Locke discusses in book four, then I don't remember if I assigned this section in book four or not. I should have if I didn't. But Locke mentions that if a child has grown up in England, so just like remember how, you know, so a child learning what we would call me learning the meaning of the word gold, Locke calls changing the idea that they... <laughs> It's Hegel, changing the idea that they that, that they make the word gold is associated with. That is changing the meaning of their of their word gold, right? So when the child first applies the word gold to everything yellow, that's what the word gold means for them. Remember, words are ideas of are signs of ideas in the mind of the speaker. So. Uh, so, you know, and then later the child learns that other people make that word a sign of a more complex idea than that, and they include heaviness and fusibility and so forth. They've changed the meaning of their word gold to be more like ours, <laughs> right? So in, in book four, at one point, Locke imagines a child growing up in England and coming to associate the, um, to include the idea of, and this is a rare case where he uses white the way we use the word white. He says, coming to include the idea of whiteness or flesh color in England in their idea, the idea they associate with the word, I guess he says man, but we would say human being. And then he says, that child can prove to you the sentence, a Negro is not a man. It's true according to what they mean, because they've included this idea of whiteness in their, the idea that they make their word man a sign of. So does that mean that's just fine? Well, for that we have to ask, um, um, what are we going to do in our laws with the word human being or man? And for that, we have to ask, well, what should we do? And that's a question about the divine law, right? So, I mean, that's, you know, when you ask that, absolutely, you're asking, what is the divine law? Well, then we have to know, you know, but it's, it seems based on what Locke says here and in the second treatise, Although he's, he, I don't know anywhere if he's completely, uh, okay, now I've got Wollstonecraft, Thoreau, and Dougal Stewart. And Michael. And <laughs> Alana refers to, insists on referring to Georg Hegel as George Hegel. 
<laughs> there he is. Um, anyway, um, uh, what was I saying? Right. So it seems like, you know, I mean, I, I guess that's the question. What is, what is the public that we think that God wills the, the, the public good of? Is it the species human being? Some things he says seem to tend in that direction. So in that case, we would have to ask, well, you know, okay, does that species that for whatever reason we think God wills the good of, should, should that include the idea of whiteness? Well, I mean, from what Locke says in this book, as opposed to necessarily what he did when he wrote the Constitution of Carolina, um, from what Locke says in this book, it seems pretty clear that um, um, whiteness should not, or flesh color in England, should not be included in that idea, right? He uses often examples of um, people from America or Africa in a way that indicates that it seems like for moral purposes they're interchangeable with, with us. Um, um, moreover, it seems likely that the public that Locke actually thinks we know God cares about is like as for example Leibniz would say the community of finite rational beings, in which case that has serious implications for both of the examples we've been talking about, right? If it's true that people whose skin is not white are finite rational beings, then not counting them as human beings and therefore leaving them out of our legal prote protections or something like that, if that there were the consequence, would be wrong. And that use of the word, therefore, would be, or at least would tend to doing something morally wrong. So the child is, at least if the child is going to then apply that word to, in legal or moral contexts, is doing something wrong by using the word that way. And they're, I mean, of course, they're just a child, so maybe you can't hold them accountable. But in the end, they're, you know, like if they keep doing that when they're an adult, they're, they're responsible for that. And if they say, how do you know, maybe those people have a different real essence than me, we say, you don't know your real essence either. All you know is what ideas that you've decided voluntarily to collect together for certain purposes. And that kind of voluntary collection is subject to moral restrictions when it's done for certain purposes. Okay, that's everything I have to say about, oh, Jill Spencer asked, so like schemas, I'm not sure at what point you asked that, but like, uh, you mean like Kant's schemas, like schemas of concepts in Kant? Oh, like psych. Okay, the way it's used in contemporary psychology. Um, I don't think I'm familiar enough with that as to... Uh, yeah, but if it's supposed to be... So I don't know exactly how the word schema is being used in contemporary psychology. Uh, but if it's supposed to be something kind of like different from the idea or a concept, we have a concept and then we have a certain schema, then Locke isn't making that distinction here. The schema is the concept, right? What we have is a certain collection of simple ideas and that's as far as he goes with this. Um, okay, any other questions? Well, like a child calling everything doggy. Yeah, okay. Garrett has a cognitive, has a definition from a, some website. Um, cognitive framework or concept that helps organize and interpret information. Right. I mean, so uh, that's what a complex idea of substances is, according to Locke. It is that kind of schema. 
um, not just helps to organize and interpret information, it is the entire way we have of organizing information from our senses. Um, right? The only way we have, I mean, I guess you could say there's two ways of doing it. One is via modes, and the other is via ideas of substances. But the way of doing it via modes doesn't require that anything necessarily correspond to the mode. So it's not guaranteed to be any of any use in um, interpreting the information that actually comes in. So it's ideas of substances that are supposed to be taken from the qualities that we actually have experienced together. And it's supposed to help us to recognize a certain combination when it comes up again. And if that's what they mean by that definition of schema, then that is what Locke is calling the idea of sort of substances. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know, like a child calling everything doggy. There's another comment. Um, I'll just explain what I mean real quick. Yeah. In psychology, a schema is like, uh, as a child grows up, it looks at like uh, an animal with four legs that's furry, and they call it a doggy because they're overgeneralizing the idea of a dog. And so I thought that applied to uh, him saying that, it, like, a child calling everything gold that, like, kind of looks like gold is overgeneralizing their idea of gold before they learn. Like, this right. But, yeah, but I mean, I think the key difference between the way Locke is thinking about it and the way you just described it and how that applies to how psychologists think about it now, I don't know. But the key difference is that except for the type of moral mistake that I was that I was explaining later on, the child is not making a mistake. They're not overgeneralizing. You can't make a mistake in what idea you make a certain sound the sign of because it's arbitrary right so if the child makes the sound doggy the sign of the idea of any animal with four legs then that is what the child means when they make that sound now i mean it's true they're out of step with our convention right? They're not speaking the same language as us. I guess to the extent that they want to speak the same language as us, and in fact want pretty strongly to speak the same language as us because they want to get us to do things for them. <laughs> um, they, you know, I guess you could, that's a kind of error, but it's not overgeneralization. It's just having not learned English correctly yet. and still speaking their own language instead. Um, because that idea, anything with four legs, is a perfectly good idea. And there's no reason it couldn't, the doggy couldn't mean that. It just doesn't happen to mean that in proper English. But it could. And that's what it means in the child's language. That's the way he's thinking about it. Um, um, so, in, so I guess to sum it up, the, the error the child has made is not an error in ideas. It's an error in, um, it's a linguistic error in learning our language. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so I'm now going to go on because, as, as usual, I spent way too long on this. I wonder if it's okay if I remove these refrigerator hats. <laughs> Children discover all kinds of things. <laughs> In this case, Alana has discovered that this whiteboard has, I guess, has metal in it, and therefore you can stick refrigerator magnets to it if you want to. But, um, we'll see crap. Uh, Stewart and Hegel. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about knowledge. Um,
Fortunately, I've been kind of preparing the way for what Locke is going to eventually say about knowledge for, um, for a long time. So I hope it's not too surprising. But still, what he says about it is, um, well, first of all, that knowledge is... conversant about ideas. So this is similar and kind of similarly, at, let, let's say, um, well, let me just say what it's similar to first. It's similar to what he says at the beginning of book three, namely that words are signs of ideas. Words are signs of ideas, and similarly, knowledge is about ideas. Um, now, I think in both cases, at first that sounds kind of, um, I don't know, unsurprising. What else would it be a sign of other than our ideas? What else would knowledge be about other than ideas? But, um, but in both cases, it becomes more surprising when you realize how strictly he means it. Words are not signs of things. They're only signs of my ideas. They're not signs of anyone else's ideas. They're only signs of my ideas, right? And similarly, all my knowledge is about my ideas. So it's not about things. Well, of course, I mean, that is, it's not immediately about things. It's about, it can be about things only insofar as my ideas are ideas of things. That's what will allow my knowledge to be, to be connected to things. Okay, so um, to things outside of me or to the operations of my own mind. Because as I said, Ray, to begin with a long time ago, in both cases, uh, we don't perceive those things directly, but only by way of ideas, according to Locke. So all our knowledge is about ideas, and moreover, he adds something else. It's all about agreement and disagreement. of ideas. Um, so, uh, it's, at least normally, he seems to think of it this way, although, as I mentioned, uh, some of the examples seem to include more than two ideas. Normally, he thinks of it this way, a piece of knowledge, so to speak, a, propos a known proposition consists of two ideas plus the certainty that they agree or disagree with each other. So, like, for example, uh, if I know that, um, all extended things have figure, that is, have a shape, that piece of knowledge, which Locke does think we know that, we can be certain of that, that piece of knowledge consists of the two ideas, extended and shape, plus the certainty that they agree with each other. They go together. So, um, so if that, so if all knowledge is about agreement and disagreement of ideas, this uh, suggests a two-way classification um, of the two the, the two-way classification of knowledge that Locke introduces. So the first one is by type of agreement. Or type of disagreement. Right? So Locke is going to list four different ways that ideas can be said to agree or disagree. 
And corresponding to those four different ways, there are four kinds of um, knowledge. I think, I mean, there really, you could say there's four types of propositions, generally speaking. There's four types of propositions um, and uh, um, if we're certain about the truth of a proposition, then we have knowledge. So there's four types of knowledge. I guess, you know, I should probably write that maybe, I keep saying it, but um, maybe if I erase this, Knowledge is certainty about agreement and disag disagreement of ideas. Because, um, and I think in previous years I've explained this a little bit wrong, uh, because I tried to make Locke sound more similar to the way people might define knowledge now. But, uh, but on reflection, I, I think it's pretty clear this is what he thinks. So in other words, even if you're right, um, right? So like if I say, you know, or if I uh, accept the proposition, uh, you know, all elephants are gray, um, but I'm not certain, which unless gray is part of my idea of elephant, uh, Locke is going to say I couldn't be certain. It's only going to be probability. So if I'm not certain, even if it turns out I'm right, and even if I had good reason to think that they were all gray, still, since I'm not certain, that's not knowledge. So that means we, that's going to mean we don't have very much knowledge. Right? That is, that Locke is restricting knowledge to uh, the term knowledge to a pretty narrow range of circumstances because there has to be an agreement or disagreement between ideas that you don't just, you, it's not enough to have a good reason to think they agree with each other and be right. That's, I'm alluding to the definition of knowledge as justified true belief. Um, right? That's not enough. You have to be certain. And I guess, I mean, certainty here is understood as rational certainty, right? That is, when we say you have to be certain, we don't mean you have to be, like, unwilling to think anything else. Who knows why? Right? That would be madness, <laughs> right? If I won't separate these ideas, but I don't have any reason not to separate them. You, we, that, you could call that certainty, but that's not what Locke means by certainty. He means certainty in a sense where certainty guarantees being correct. Um, because, right, like, if you really have understood the relationship well enough to be certain, you can't be wrong because that, you know, you uh, have seen exactly what these ideas are, how they're related to each other. Right, so that's what counts as knowledge according to Locke. But um, uh, getting back to this, but there's four different types of agreement or disagreement you can be certain about that would count as knowledge. And the other way of classifying knowledge is by um, by the immediacy or immediateness of the agreement, I guess I'll say. I mean, it's not precisely the immediateness or immediacy of the agreement. It's the immediacy, immediateness or immediacy, uh, sorry, immediacy or immediateness of our perception of the agreement or disagreement. If the 
Um, if I can take the two ideas and just somehow Locke often uses vision as a metaphor here, of course it's not really vision that's going on here, but if I can take the two ideas and just kind of see that they agree or disagree with each other, um, then that's called intuitive knowledge. This A and this B. So A is called intuitive. Whereas if I can only tell by putting other ideas in between, remember I explained last time how that's how Locke sees demonstration. I find other ideas to put in between, and at each step I can, so to speak, see the agreement or disagreement. So even though I, when I put the, take, take the two ideas on, the, on either end and look at them um, by themselves, I can't see whether they agree or disagree. I can connect them by a chain of ideas where I can do that. And that's called a demonstration. And so that's called demonstrative knowledge. He also introduces a third, apparently third type of knowledge, which is weird, which he calls sensitive knowledge. And I'll, I'll get to that um, later, I hope. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's hard to figure out where sensitive knowledge fits into this classification, or in fact, even how it fits under this general definition. So that's why I'm leaving it off for the moment. Okay. Other questions about that so far? Okay, so um, so I'm going to talk about the first, oh, and I guess I should say one other thing, which is that these two classifications um, definitely cut across each other to some extent, right? In other words, if you were to write, here's the four types of knowledge by agreement or disagreement, and then here's intuitive, and here's demonstrative. So... It, it may not, it seems like it's not true that all of these boxes can be filled in, but a lot of them can. So like, for example, the second type of agreement or disagreement that Locke calls relation, there's both intuitive knowledge about relation and demonstrative knowledge about relation. Um, right, so these classifications are, you know, they're, they're different ways of classifying knowledge that, that cut across each other. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the first one type first. So the, the four types of agreement and disagreement. As usual, I'm just going to keep writing agreement and not adding disagreement. But agreement and disagreement are always supposed to go together here. So the first one is what Locke calls identity and difference. Um... So identity and difference, remember identity means sameness, difference means difference, right? So sameness and difference. Um, what's an example of this? Well, um, an example of uh, difference would be like, sweet is not bitter. or white is not black, um, or, you know, anything like that. We take some simple idea, and we compare it to some other simple idea, and we see that they're not the same. 
That says not. I'm not sure how beautiful that is. C is not. Now, when I say, you know, we um, see that they're not the same, um, like, I mean, um, I don't mean by that that they're as philosophers say, or just that they're as philosophers would say numerically different. I mean, if I have the idea of sweet now, that as I perceive the idea of sweet now, and then I perceive it again later, so those are two different ideas. They're, but they're exactly the same kind of idea. So sameness here means like exactly the same kind of idea or not the same kind of idea, right? So sweet, every, idea, every time I have the simple idea sweet, it's different from any time I have the simple idea bitter. That's what I'm saying, they're two different ideas, two different simple ideas. And Locke says, just by perceiving those simple ideas together, um, or, well, that's not enough. I have to carry out the operation of comparison, I guess. Before that, I have to carry out the operation of distinction. Well, so, but anyway, just by, so to speak, looking at them together, I know that they're not the same idea. And I'm certain. And I could, there's no way I could be wrong about that, he says. So, um, so first of all, it seems like this type of knowledge is always intuitive. Second of all, it seems like when it's knowledge, properly speaking, it's always negative. I mean, an example of an apparent positive. One would be a tautology. Sweet is sweet. But um, I think Locke doesn't count this as a real proposition. Or at least he doesn't count it as a, he doesn't count the certainty of this as, as knowledge. Because it doesn't um, tell you anything about sweet. That is, um, you could know this was true without knowing what the word sweet means. So Locke says this type of proposition is merely verbal. Um, um, uh, like anyone can list a whole bunch of so-called propositions like this, but they don't have to know anything to do it. Sweet is sweet, God is God, the soul is the soul, right? All those things are certainly true, assuming those words mean anything, but I don't have to know what they mean. You know, I, like, I'm not sure if I quite follow that argument as to why this isn't a proposition. I mean, it's, it, it's unclear why. Suppose I do know what the word means. Then isn't there something I know? I, I don't know. Anyway, he doesn't count this. I mean, you can certainly see it's not very useful knowledge, if it's knowledge at all. So, so Locke says, you know, if this were the only kind of agreement and disagreement, what we would know would be only negative things, like sweet is not. We would know as many of them as we have I, different ideas we can compare to each other. So we have a lot of knowledge like this, or you know, can have a lot of knowledge like this whenever we want it, but it doesn't take us very far in some sense. Um, Oh, so I was going to say, it seems like it's always negative, and it seems like it's always intuitive. Did I say this? Maybe I already said it. It seems like it's always negative, and it seems like it's always intuitive. Um, you might think there are other examples kind of like this. So like, 
rather than gold is gold, gold is yellow. Assuming yellow is part of your complex idea that you, to which you assign the name gold. So um, um, you might think we know the agreement of those two words by identity or something like that. But uh, those, sorry, those two ideas by identity. But actually, that's the type of thing that Locke is going to discuss in chapter eight of book four under the the title trifling proposition and he says that's no better than the, than the so-called proposition yellow is yellow if yellow really is part of the complex idea that i signify by the word gold then when i say gold is yellow um i'm not expressing any possible knowledge Because I'm really just saying a yellow metal is yellow. That, that is, I'm really just saying yellow is yellow. Okay, so that's identity and difference. So it's not very interesting, although, of course, in some sense, it's absolutely essential, right? Like, we couldn't know anything if we didn't know that sweet is not bitter and white is not black and so forth. But um, it gets more interesting with the second type of agreement and disagreement, which is agreement and disagreement in relation. So this is what you might call a qualitative agreement and disagreement between ideas. Um, So an example of knowledge like this would be um, actually I'm going to run out of room. If I, I'm going to erase, erase this. Write this here. Relation. So an example of this would be the angles of a triangle equal to right angles. Right, or as we would say, they they total to 180 degrees. Um, that is the interior angles of the triangle. Right. So um, Locke says the idea of the interior angles of a triangle and the idea of two right angles are not the same idea. So by identity and difference, all we can say is. Um, the interior angles of a triangle are not two right angles. That's pretty clear. There's three interior angles of a triangle, so they can't be two right angles. Um, so, but nevertheless, although they're not the same idea, they're equal to each other. Um, meaning they have the same amount of something in them, something like that. They're, they're to the same degree of something. That's what we call a measure of angles degrees, I guess. Um, so um, that's what this kind, of, this kind of agreement and disagreement is about, generally speaking. Um, Um, and those are the usual type of examples of this type of agreement and disagreement that Locke gives, geometrical or, or uh, mathematical examples, examples involving quantities um, or degrees of something, right? So it's about equal, more, or less.
Um, Um, this kind of knowledge, Locke says, is sometimes intuitive and sometimes demonstrative. So an example uh, where it's intuitive would be if I say, um, that these three angles equal two right angles, right? Assuming this is a straight line. Locke says we can see just by looking at it that these three have the same sum as these two. The right angle, um, basically by definition, is an angle where um, um, It's the same angle on both sides of a line drawn across another line. It's the same angle here as here. So in other words, two right angles by definition add up, so to speak, to the straight angle of 180 degrees. But these, because they also go, um, erase the two right angles. These, because they also add up to all the whole semicircle between you know, uh, on this side of the line, have to have the same amount of arc of the circle or angle as the two right angles do. And Locke says we can that is intuitive. We can see that immediately. On the other hand, um, that the three angles of the triangle add up to two right angles, Locke says, we can't see immediately. And we can't see it immediately because we can't bring these three angles together to compare them to the two right angles. Okay, like if these are two right angles, you know, we could move the triangle to compare this one to, to, to the two right angles, or this one, or this one, but not all three at the same time. So we can't see intuitively whether they add up to two right angles or not. I, I think this is the way Locke literally explains it. So how can we see? Well, we have to find other ideas that we can put in between to get from one to the other. Um, in particular, at least some of the ideas that we're going to put in between. You know, why did I draw those two lines? This is the this is the triangle with its three angles. Draw a line extending the base of the triangle, and draw a parallel line through the apex of the triangle. And now, um, since these lines are parallel. This angle is the same as this angle. I might have done this demonstration before in this course, but I'm trying to do it one more time. It's short. No, no. This angle is the same as this angle. This angle is the same as this angle. And never mind whether that, that's probably already not intuitive. Other ideas have to go in between. But if once I can satisfy myself that this angle is the same as this angle, and this angle is the same as this angle, now I have a situation like this, right? These three add up to two right angles. Therefore, these three add up to two right angles. So by putting the ideas of those other angles, by putting the idea of these three angles in between the idea of these three angles and the two right angles, I'm able to finish the demonstration. People says, was this the one about proofs? Proofs and demonstrations mean the same thing, I think. 
This is the one about demonstrations or proofs in mathematics. Maybe I should make that bigger and explain it one more time. There's two ideas that we want to see if they agree or disagree. One is the idea of these three angles. And the other is the idea of these two angles. Two right angles. We can't compare them directly. So we have to find some other idea that we can put in between and compare to both of them. And as I said, at least one step in the demonstration is that instead of the idea of these three angles, we use the idea of these three angles here. Now these three angles here are definitely equal to right angles. We can see that intuitively. And the only question then is how we get to the um, result of the alternating angle theorem, which says that if these lines are parallel, this angle is the same as this, and this is the same as that. But assuming we can get that far, then you can understand how, well, we can, as soon as we get from the idea of these three angles to the idea of these three angles, then we can get from the idea of these three angles to the idea of these two angles. And then we have a demonstration. That is, we have a series of ideas that are intuitively in agreement with each other. And in this case, they're in agreement. The type of agreement is relation. They seem to be equal to each other. Um, so we have a series of ideas that are seen to agree in relation of equality. Um, and on one end of the series is these three angles. And then the other series, end of the series is these two angles. And so we've demonstrated the proposition that these three angles equal these two angles. We couldn't immediately perceive the agreement in relation, but we can immediately perceive the agreement in relation by putting other ideas in between. Now I'm going to erase this, so I can write the next type of agreement and disagreements. Coexistence or necessary connection. So coexistence or necessary connection is when we, the agreement in coexistence or necessary connection means that um, the ideas go together because whatever has the quality to produce the perception of one of them also has the quality that is the power to produce the perception of the other one. I mean, you know, it's so tempting, and Locke gives into this temptation, and I'm probably going to give into it too, to just say whatever has one has the other, right? So, like, so an example of this would be, you know, something like, um, gold is soluble in aqua regia. Now, I mean, uh, Locke actually gives an example like that. In fact, yeah, that's the exact example he gives in Book 4, uh, Chapter 1, Section 6. It's going to turn out, and he says this explicitly when you get to Chapter 3, Section 14, that uh, that's not knowledge. That's only probability. Right, maybe I should show you that actually. Book four, chapter three, section fourteen, on page four eighty five. Yeah. 
Um, Thus, though we see the yellow color and, upon trial, find the weight, malleableness, fusibility, and fixedness that are united in a piece of gold, yet because no one of these ideas has any evident dependence or necessary connection with the other, we cannot certainly know that where any four of these are, the fifth will be there also, how highly probable soever it may be. Right, so um, that means that, okay, suppose I, suppose I say, well, I'm not certain those always go together, but I'm collecting those all together and making them an idea of gold. And now I'm going to consult another idea, solubility in aqua regia. The same thing's going to happen again. Because there's no visible necessary connection between those five qualities and solubility in aqua regia, um, therefore, however probable it may seem, I cannot know with certainty, that is, um, I cannot certainly know, right? That implies that knowledge might not be certain, but I think he, uh, he makes it clear in the next sentence that that's an improper way of speaking according to him. Um, um, because the highest probability amounts not to certainty, without which there can be no true knowledge, right? So knowledge, again, knowledge, strictly speaking, requires certainty. And because uh, I, can't, I can't be, however probable it seems that everything that's yellow, heavy, fusible, etc., will also be soluble in aqua regia, I cannot certainly know that solubility in aqua regia will always go with the others. And so that's not knowledge, it's probability. But that also suggests what might be uh, the rare exception where we do have knowledge like this. Now, I mean, it suggests that it's a little bit of cheating because this is the very passage that I used when I, a long time ago, said that um, what's special about the primary qualities is there is a visible necessary connection between their ideas. It was, I, if you remember, he didn't say that back in book two when he introduced the primary secondary quality distinction. I had to go ahead to this passage in book four to, to get that. Right, where he says some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and a visible connection one with another, as figure necessarily supposes extension. Receiving or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity. Right, so that means that a real example of this type of knowledge, one that really is knowledge according to Locke, would be something like... Um, Um, everything figured is extended. Right? That is uh, not according to Locke, a trifling proposition or rate right, that is, I don't think um, the ideas of figure, the idea of figure and the idea of, well, actually, considering how he introduces the idea of figure, this might not be a good example. Except his putting it on that list implies that it is a good example. Okay, let's assume for the time being that figure is not, um, I guess I'd say that extension is not included in the definition of figure. You might think it is because you might think figure, and remember, figure just means shape, right? So 
you might think it is because you might think that the definition of figure or extension or uh, shape is having extension limited in a certain way. And so from that you would see that saying everything figured is extended is just saying everything extended is extended. But let's assume that's not the case. So then uh, this would count as a real example of knowledge like this. Because we do know, and in this case, I guess intuitively, that whatever has the, um, the quality of figure also has the quality of extension. That is, whatever has the power to cause in me the idea of figure has the power to cause in me the idea of extension. Um, but those powers are real powers because those are primary qualities. So this also suggests um, that um, there's one type of substance that we do know the real essence of namely body, right? That sort of substance is sorted out by primary quality of solidity. And we do know the necessary connection of solidity with all the other primary qualities. And with the other powers that bodies have, such as the, well, the one power they have of causing other bodies to move by impulse. Um, so, um, I think, you know, if you look at these so far, you can see that, um, Locke, as I said, thinks that we don't have very much knowledge. Um, we don't have, we have practically no knowledge like this. We have knowledge like this only in um, the limited case of certain ideas that we can intuitively compare to each other or by means of other ideas compare to each other in quantity. And for this, we have only this negative knowledge about simple ideas. Um, but although this knowledge is very limited, it's really important. So I already said, you know, this one is absolutely essential to all thought in general to know that one idea is not another idea. <laughs> um, but this one includes apparently all of mathematics. And this one includes physics. mechanistic physics, right? The physics that tells us, as Locke and Descartes and Spinoza all believe, exactly how bodies can influence each other's motion. Um, so, like I said, it's limited, but it's actually really important. Um, now, the fourth type is the weird one which is real existence. Um, I guess before I talk about real existence, I do want to say one thing here, which is um, I won't spend any time on it because it will only be interesting if you know something about Kant, or if you later know something about Kant. But um, these four, you have enough room to write this. These four, I think, basically line up with Kant's categories or headings of categories, quantity, quality, relation, 
in Modell. And therefore, because these are lined up with what Kant calls the concepts of reflection, they also line up with the concept of reflection in Kant. And sure enough, the first pair of concepts of reflection in Kant is identity and difference. So I think um, uh, this is one of the sources from which Kant, or that suggested to Kant the way he divides up the, the, his list of categories and the way he divides them up, was this list of the four types of agreement and disagreement in Locke. There's also a source in Leibniz, which I won't talk about. All right. Um, anyway, back to this real existence. So, um, so Locke says, um, that this type is about whether actual real existence agrees with our idea. So an example of this that's supposed to be intuitive is I exist. And an example of it that's supposed to be demonstrative is God exists. And without yet talking about Locke's demonstration of this and how it's supposed to work, I hope to talk about that next time, I, I just want to point out that um, a key step in Locke's demonstration that God exists is this um, proposition, I exist, right? And this is just like in the third meditation when uh, Descartes' proofs of the existence of God, or at least one of them, the other one also involves this somehow. But in any case, um, at least one of the proofs in the third meditation involves a step like, but I at least exist, and therefore, um, um, that form of proof actually was invented by St. Augustine, probably, and maybe uh, that's one of the reasons, that, one of the places that Descartes got it from, but never mind that. So anyway, the point is, the point I'm making here is, that the demonstration that God exists, like all demonstrations, has to consist of intuitively known steps. And this is one of the steps in the demonstration of trying to walk. I exist. It's one of the intuitive steps. Um, okay. Um, are there any other examples of this? Well, so apparently there's this other example, which is something like, Suppose I'm now perceiving the idea of white. Then, um, I can conclude, conclude, maybe that's not the right word, but I know that something white is present. Meaning that something white is exists and it's here now. That's what, that's what Locke calls sensitive knowledge. He says it's limited to the objects that are here right now. And although he doesn't emphasize this, I think it's clear that it's limited to things like this. Something white is present. Right? That is, if I went beyond this to say a snowball is present, um, um, if that, if I'm using the word snowball the way I should as the name of a sort of substance, then according to Locke, that just means something white round, cold, etc., is present, and it will be just like that. But if by snowball I mean a certain kind of real essence, then I don't know that. 
Um, so like, in other words, if you say, well, suppose someone has set up a complicated machine that causes in me the illusion that there's a snowball there when there isn't. That's an example of the abuse of a name of substance because that machine, according to the nominal essence of snowball, is a snowball. However, it works. Right? Just like whatever makes the hands turn the right way is a clock, whether it includes a spring or hog bristles. So, you know, whatever causes me to perceive white, round, cold, etc., the other qualities of a snowball, however it works, whatever its bulk, figure, texture, and motion of parts is, is a snowball. It conforms to the nominal essence. So, um, so that's what this type of sensitive knowledge is about. In other words, if I have certain ideas, I know that something that has the power to cause me to perceive those ideas as present. Um, okay, so those are the three examples which Locke is going to discuss in more detail later, but um, um, I just want to point out, and I don't have time to say more about it, but, um, you know, actually, I think I already said what I needed to say about intuition and demonstration when I gave that long example with the triangle. So I actually got to everything almost I wanted to say today. All I'm going to say about this is that, of course, number one, it's not clear what ideas I'm supposed to be seeing the agreement or disagreement between in these cases. Is it an agreement or disagreement between the idea of myself and the idea of existence? Um, But whatever that means, how can that be? What? Because what I wanted to do was to compare my idea to something that's not an idea. Not to some other idea like the idea of existence, whatever that is. I wanted to compare it to see if it agrees with the thing. So, um, so it's very hard to understand... Um, um, either what kind of agreement and disagreement of ideas this is supposed to be or how it can fit under the, the title agreement and disagreement of ideas in general. That is how, it's, how it counts as the kind of knowledge that Locke has defined. Um, and yet, you know, he goes on and on about this. So there must be some answer to that. I might try to say a little bit about how to suggest how I might suggest to look at that next time, but um, but it is certainly very weird, and because it's weird, it also makes it hard to understand um, all three of these examples how they're supposed to work, right? Like, what ideas am I supposed to see the immediate agreement and disagreement between in the case of this proposition, I exist. And what ideas are supposed to be on the two ends of the demonstration in the case of God exists, such that I'm able to put other ideas in between them to join them up. Um, and then in this one, it's just not, yeah, it's... Um, maybe in some sense that could be seen as the easiest case. But it's, even if it's easiest, it's not very easy, <laughs> right? How does that work that I, um, what proposition am I getting to know and how just by the fact that something caused me to perceive the idea of white? Okay, um, that's all I have time for, but um, I'm actually kind of caught up, which is good news, and uh, I will see you um, next week. Okay. Bye.